you say you're not alone? You're not alone. Spent the last several weeks going over the subject, which is our annual, our theme for the year, not alone. And the importance of understanding this because the number one killer in our society today is loneliness. And loneliness doesn't mean, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't mean that there's not, or that there, yeah, the absence of people. You can have people in your life and still be lonely. You can be married and still be lonely. You can be in a family and still be lonely. Amen, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? So we're going to talk about that today. We've got some stuff we want to share with you. We feel like God's going to do some incredible things. But um, as you can see in our church, we try to amalgamate the past with the present in order to reach the future. I, I don't think that some of that stuff in the past should all be discarded. And, and there are some things we need to do today, but if we can work together and reach the future, we're going to do really, really good. Amen? So the way I started preaching was my pastor gave me an opportunity. He gave me an opportunity to share and speak. And man, I just see so many of these young people, God just doing amazing things in the lives of young people right now. And so I'm going to turn this stage over for about five minutes to one of our young, amazing leaders who's coming up, who is a testimony of parents who have been praying. I want you to help me to welcome my friend Isaiah uh, Patterson. I need a microphone. He's going to share with us for a little bit. Uh, Changing Point Church, if you don't know, <laughs> if you guys don't know, um, I'm Isaiah Patterson. Uh, I grew up in, in Changing Point Church as, as a kid. Um, I grew up in the plays. I remember doing all the plays, sitting in the back of the aisles, um, <laughs> sleeping during the night services, waking up, service is still going on. Uh, so th those, were, those were definitely the good times. And, and I kind of, I say good times because I kind of got away from uh, the church for a, a period of my life, and I went wayward. Um, my story almost kind of reminds me of like the prodigal son. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that story, but the prodigal son, he begins to uh, leave the father, takes all his inheritance and leaves the father, and you know, goes on his own. Um, but what hit me the most when I was studying the prodigal son this week was um, when he came back to his senses and he, he started coming back to the father, uh, he, he uh, he didn't look at himself through the father's eyes. He looked at himself through how this world seen him. So he was not coming back as, as how the father seen him as a son. He was coming back as a, I believe it was like a hired servant or whatever. And um, I believe that was me for a very long time, especially uh, I was in church for like two years, uh, believing I, was, I wasn't worthy of it, um, believing God didn't have a calling in my life, believing that I didn't have a voice to speak out and, and speak and preach the gospel um, like the prodigal son, and God uh, began to reveal to me, began to show me as I began to be in relationship with him. I began to, I began to dig deeper in, in my word, and, and I'm not a reader. If y'all you, if know me, like, I hate reading. Um, I graduated, I, I graduated my school in English probably with, like, a D. I, I barely got past um, English, <laughs> but there was something that the, the day I opened the word of God, there was something that spoke life into my soul. It spoke life into my situations that I was in, and it breathed life into me. And I, I began to just continue just to, just to dig in his word, and, and he began to speak to me and show me different things. And, and, and the, the DT classes, I don't know if you guys have been in the DT classes or any, any May, New, May, May New Weekend. It's, it's been a big help in my life and just learning how to dig in deeper, learning into being to prayer and stuff like that. Um, I had this, this, this word holy in my mind the whole week, the word holy, holy. And I was, I was just looking like, what does the word holy mean? Like, what does that mean? And I looked it up and started getting digging deeper. And it just means simply to be set apart. Set apart from this world, set apart from the things of this world. And I, I was just like, why did I, how, how did I get so caught up in this world? And, and it goes back to pastor's message, not alone, like not, not the enemy trying to get you in this isolation to believe that you're alone, that you have nobody around you. I have an amazing, beautiful family that was around me Come this on. whole time. I had, I had an amazing church that was, that pastor was preaching beautiful messages, amazing messages, powerful messages. 
But I just sat there and I felt alone. So I just, I, and, and mostly it was because I didn't want to receive it. I didn't step out in faith. We talk about, we talk about revival, revival, revival. To, for, to some of us think it's just an event or maybe it's just at a tent or what, uh, uh, a, thing, uh, a thing going on. But revival is a lifestyle that we have to live. It's a lifestyle that we have to live as Christians. Uh, Apostle, Apostle Paul, I just got done reading Acts and he's, his story is amazing. He he, uh, he motivates me to keep on going, and he, he motivates me to preach boldly. Don't stop no matter what anybody around says to you. The voices are going to get loud. The people are going to get loud. It is going to get hard, but we serve a God that shuts the mouths of lions. We serve a God that is faithful to bring us through it every single time. Every single time. Every single time. And it just it came to my, to my realization. is like I sat in church for two years not receiving what the Lord had for us. And we can be in the move of God, but ha not have the move of God in us. Come on. You know, we can, I, I was sitting in that exact seat right there for two years, but I wasn't receiving what the Lord had for us. The Lord was in the move, on, on the move. He was powerful. He was, he was healing people. He was delivering people, <clears throat> but I didn't receive it. I just sat back and just like had a rebellion spirit and a stubborn spirit that I just didn't want to receive. And the day, the day I, I, I just said, you know what, I have, an, I have enough, I'm, I'm done. Like, I can't live this life alone. I have to open up, I have to, I have to come back to my first love just like the prodigal son. And I promise you, once you come back to your first love, not only is he going to accept you as your son, but he's going to love you, he's going to embrace you, he's going to build you up. You're not a mistake, you're not a failure. You are who God says you are. You are a son of God, you are a daughter of the kings, you are a daughter of the most high God. He loves us so much. He loves us so much. And the day I received that was the day I had the, the most joy, the most peace, the most love I ever felt in my life. Awesome. Living, living this worldly lifestyle, I used to say, we always used to say this slogan, I'm living my best life. I'm living my best life. I'll, I'll share a little bit of my testimony. I, I really didn't want to get into it because I'm like, God, do I really got to share that part? But he began to remind me that there's, there's men, there's other people that are dealing with the same story that I'm dealing with, and people need that deliverance. People need that hope that there is a way out, that you don't have to be stuck in the ways of this world, that there is a way out, and that is through Jesus Christ. That is the blood of Jesus. That is still the blood to this day. It is all powerful. Come it is on, all son. powerful. It will wash anything that you have done. Amen. And so I, I just began to just dig in deeper, dig in deeper. Um, Man, the, the main new weekend, it, it was, it changed my life. It opened, it opened up new doors and, and how I seen God and how, how I worship God. I remember coming out of the water. And when I came out of the water, there was only one name. There was only one name. And it, it, it was just happened. The Holy Spirit literally just took over me. And I literally just came out of the water. I didn't think of any other name to say. There was only one name. And it was Jesus Christ. And I Come yelled on. it out, Jesus, because he was the one. He was the one. I searched this world. I searched this world. I tried the alcohol. I tried the party life. I tried the sexual sin. I tried, I was, there was, there was a demonic, there was a demonic addiction that was on my life that sometimes it's hard to talk about in a church because some people just, when you, when you say the word, some people just kind of like Judge you. lose their breath or kind of just like, yeah. you know, but pornography Addiction is a real addiction, and it will kill you. It will kill you, and it won't only just kill you as a man, but it will kill you spiritually. It will kill you spiritually and drain you dry. And I dealt with that for so many years of my life. And there was, I felt like there was no way out. I was alone. I was alone. And, and even though I had my family, I just, I didn't feel like I could speak to them. I was so ashamed. I was like, man, I'm dealing with this addiction. But I promise you, there's no addiction, no sickness, no illness, no, no nothing that the, the Lord can't deliver you from. I'm a living testimony. I'm a living, breathing testimony that the Lord can deliver you from those demonic things. You don't have to deal with that anymore. You don't have to go on with that anymore. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is good to bring you through it. Every single time, on, every single time. Come I don't on, care what son. storm you're in. I don't care what trial you're in. I'll call on the name of Jesus. And when you call on the name of Jesus, he will show up. He will show up. It wasn't the, it wasn't the day. It was the day I began. It was the day I began to get on the altar. It was the day I began to surrender myself. It was the day I began to, to take off my <laughs> crown and, and take off this ego and this pride that I got on. Us, us men, we carry this ego and this pride, like, you know, we're, these, we're this macho man and whatever. And I understand it's the way we grew up.
but man, it's something about the presence of a God that I'm so vulnerable, I'm so emotional, I can't control it, I just want to let it out. He's so good, he's so good, like I'm still, like that song was saying, I'm so in awe of him, I'm so in awe of him, I'm still so in awe of how I can deal with that demonic Thing for so long and just come to him like literally it, I just literally said God I don't want this anymore in my life God I am done with this lifestyle God I am done with it all God take it from me and I promise you that day I, I surrendered myself and I gave my life to him I'm standing up here eight months delivered fully delivered from that demonic addiction it doesn't have no change on me anymore it doesn't have no control over me anymore just like Jesus rose from the dead, just like Jesus rose from the dead, we can raise from these addictions as well. Through the power of the living God. He is faithful. He is faithful. I promise you he's faithful. If there's one thing I can promise you, he is faithful. He is faithful. He is so good. He is so good, man. It's, 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 like I said, some of us have, have this doubt or some of us have this I don't know if I should go up there. I don't know if, if and, we, and we almost want to, we almost want to wait for God to drop a beam or drop a light right in front of us or something or, or, or tingle us in our, in our uh, give us a little tug or whatever. But God is saying, children of God, I need you to come out with, with faith, with, this, with, with just not caring what anybody thinks. You think the woman of issue of blood could have got healed and she stood back and she didn't push through the crowd and she didn't act out in faith? No. The woman that issued blood knew she had to push through. She knew she had to go to God. She knew she had to touch the hem of his garment. It wasn't about, it wasn't about the hem of the garment. It was about her faith. It was about her faith. We have to have faith Come on. And, 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 and stop doubting our God because he's all powerful and he is so good. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Proud of you, son. Way to go, man. Way to go. Got us the young preacher here. Woo! Come on. Woo! Raising up the next generation. Come on. Come on. You worried about March Madness? We just released the madness up in here. Come on. Isaiah, keep letting the Lord use you, son. Amen. It's only the beginning of what God has for you. Amen. 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 All right. Somebody say, get out the cave. Get out the cave. Get out the cave. So today I want to finalize this series as we continue on the theme. And I promise I won't take as long as everybody else took. I got, as a matter of fact, just give me 15 minutes on that clock, please. I, not that I'm going to stay within 15 minutes, but it might make you feel better. So I'm just going to walk you through a few men who went through a cave experience that I think we can extrapolate some wisdom for our own life and, and learn that although we're alone, God uses moments of isolation for our strength and for his glory. So, I'm, no, you don't have to raise your hand, but a lot of us here are dealing with depression. It's clinically proven that, that so many people, because of loneliness, are depressed. And we get discouraged and we find ourselves disconnected. So then we start making choices that pull us further away from those we love and then further away from the Lord. So what do you do? What do you do with these crises? What do you do with this loneliness? Well, instead of leaning towards depression, instead of leaning towards discouragement, why don't we lean to see what Jesus does in these moments? And I, I want to show you some things that Jesus does that I think are going to be really, really helpful to you. Look at somebody and say, pay attention. I'm going to start telling you a story uh, again. So let's start with Joseph. So I'm going to say Joseph. Joseph's story is found in the book of Genesis, and, and you can read it here on your own time. But like I said, I've got just a limited time, so let me, let me get through this. Joseph winds, wind up, winds up getting thrown in a pit, right, a form of a cave, by his 11 brothers. 11 brothers. <clears throat> How many of you ever been to a grid kids game? You ever seen these kids, like, score touchdowns and throw a whole party? I'm like, son, nobody's watching you. Nobody even knows you're playing. But you do things when you're young that you don't understand, right? You beat your chest, and, and that really wasn't a very significant play. You, you do that, you, you, you get vibrato, you get really brave, you get really loud when you're young. Did you just see me? Did you see me? Yeah, that guy was half your size, and you 
Bowl them over. Simmer down a little bit. All right. Well, Eli, what are you saying? This is what Joseph was doing. God called him. He had these crazy dreams. And he showed them to his brother. You know you're going to bow down to me one day? How would you feel if your little brother was telling you, you're going to bow down to me? Look at me. I'm so good. And brothers was like, I'm going to choke this kid. Let daddy go somewhere. I'm going to put this kid in a hole and we're all going to forget about him. Because, because sometimes everything that God shows you doesn't mean you need to show everybody. How many of you have ever done something here you regretted when you were young? Yeah, Joseph is about to learn a lesson right here. Just because God called you doesn't mean you need to belittle or marginalize anybody else. Does that make sense? So what do his brothers do? They throw him in a pit and they get ready. Well, well the idea is they're planning to kill him. And, and, and this is, this is going to be the reoccurring theme through every cave we walk through, okay? <clears throat> they get ready to kill him, and before they kill him, Reuben says, let's not kill him. Let's sell him to a, a band of, of travelers that's coming. We can sell him as a slave. Now, a lot of you don't know the significance about that, but let me, let me help you. Everybody say Reuben. Anybody know who Reuben was in the lineage of Joseph? He was the oldest brother. It was the older brother who came in and said, listen, I, I know he makes you mad. I know he's a little cocky. I know he's arrogant. He thinks all that in a bag of chips, right? But we can't kill him. We, we got to sell him. We got to find another way, right? So it's because of the intervention of the older brother. If you read Hebrews, the Bible speaks of Jesus, the firstborn amongst many brethren, and he becomes our our older brother. So, so the issue is not why did you get in the cave? Sometimes you work yourself into a cave. Sometimes you work yourself into a bad situation. Sometimes your mouth gets you in trouble. I know you don't like this kind of preaching. I'm just warming up. Stay with me, right? Sometimes it's your own mouth. Have you ever said something to your spouse? You said like, man, can I take that back? Is there a way I can rewind that? No, man, I, that actually came out of my mouth. Snap, right? All right, now you're in the cave. <laughs> You're in the cave because you couldn't control what you said. And so the older brother, who was Jesus, showed up. And here's what I want you to learn. When you're in the cave, don't complain about what got you there. Focus on who's about to get you out. You're going to get in caves. You're going to get there. Joseph got there not just one time. Joseph got there another time. He finally goes. They sell him, you know, to Potiphar's house. He's at Potiphar's house. He's doing a great job as a slave. He gets promoted all the way to Potiphar's uh, top uh, control guy. And then, and, and guess what happens? You, you, you know the story, right? Potiphar's wife gets the hots for him. Look at all these good looking men around here. Come on. Potiphar's wife gets the hots for him. And she says to him, hey, you and me, kind of hook up a little bit. And he's like, dude, there's no way I could do that to my God or to Potiphar. You, you got to leave me alone, right? But then he makes a mistake. He makes a mistake. He goes to, to, the pot, to Potiphar's house in the evening by himself. Now, I know he probably went to work to pick up some files and he had to get ready some paperwork. I totally believe that. I totally believe that, right? But what happens is she takes advantage of him being alone. And this is a lesson to be learned. Now he's in the prison because he made a mistake. The first one, he was just a little too loud. He was bragging. This time he just dropped the ball. He dropped the ball. And, and listen, I, I'm going to help you out with this. If you're a guy, if you're a guy, just good practices. If you're going to be in a meeting with a girl, have an open door policy. Don't let some woman come in your door, pastor, where it's a new age. Okay. Okay, they'll still put you in jail. I wouldn't believe that, right? They'll still put you in jail. They'll still take your future. They'll still put you in the pit. Okay, so what I'm saying is this. Sometimes we get in the pit and it wasn't necessarily our fault. Somebody else was trying to mess up or mess us up and we're in the pit. Now you have a choice here. You're in the cave again. You're isolated again. What are you going to do? You can focus on the fact that I'm in the pit and it's not my fault. And Why am I here? I don't deserve this. And all of that is true. He didn't deserve that. But he's there. And here's where I want you and I to come to. Stop letting the negativity in your life cause you to miss an opportunity. Because the very next thing that God brings to him is an opportunity. Don't look at your isolation as a moment of separation. Isolation prepares you for an opportunity. The opportunity was the baker and the winemaker. Remember that? The baker and the wine tester 
both had a dream and they couldn't interpret it. And there was a dilemma in Pharaoh's house. In part, excuse me, Pharaoh's house, right? So here's Joseph's experience. Joseph's experience is because he's in the isolated, because he's alone, he doesn't turn on all the Netflix movies he can watch. Right? He doesn't put all the alcohol down he can put out. He doesn't try to drown his misery. First of all, he has the cleanest prison in the whole uh, uh, country. He has the most organized prison. He starts putting his gifts to work. Don't let isolation stop you from being who you are. The opportunity's coming. You're going to miss it if you let the isolation scare you away. Opportunity came. The dreams were interpreted. And guess what happened? He got to the place God designed him to be from the very beginning. There are certain things that you'll miss out if you're not quiet during your times of isolation and let the Lord teach you. Teach you. Are you upset with your spouse? And have you guys separated for a couple of days? You're not going to believe this. You're not the only couple that's ever gone through that. But very few couples learn in that moment of quietness what God is saying to them. So we come back, check this out. We come back and we have the same argument this week that we did. And the week before that. And the week before that. And this cyclical argument keeps happening. I'm trying to help your marriage here today. Stay with me. This cyclical argument keeps happening because nobody is being quiet enough to hear what God is saying in the cave. That makes sense? Look at someone say, that's Joseph. Joseph got visited by Jesus the older brother, while he was in the cave. Amen? Amen. Elijah had a cave. Let me put this up. Man, you just want to come and dress me, baby. Come on. Yes. <laughs> she said, yes. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> Elijah in his cave. Some say Elijah. <clears throat> oh, man. Yo, I'm already out of time. Elijah was sent to his cave by a woman with a rebellious spirit. Jezebel made the prophet afraid and ran him into a, 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 a cave. Now, I got to say something to you. I want you to, I want you to notice this. If you're not paying attention in our political climate, it is a feminist uh, liberal mindset that is trying to shut the church down and keep us quiet. It's the spirit of Jezebel trying to stop the prophet of Elijah. It's all this liberalism to take everything, accept everything. Listen to me. I appreciate my wife. Not only do I appreciate her, I honor her. I let her speak to me. She's telling me in front of everybody here that my microphone is off. That I need to straighten up. I'm trying to preach. She's in the fear of my message. She is, she is not a part of my life. She's, she is my life. There's not just section for Teresa. You understand what I'm saying? Teresa is part of my life. Having said that, there is an order in the house of God. And you should not be silent to a feministic spirit that's trying to tell you to stay quiet when you know what the truth really is. Amen. Amen. You know the truth. Men need to be men. Amen. <laughs> women need to be women. Amen. Be proud of who you are. <laughs> God didn't make a mistake when he made you. There's not multiple genders. Male, female, Adam and Eve. That's it. Amen. Follow what I'm saying? All right, before I stay on that subject. He's in a cave, and he's in a time of despair, and he feels lonely. It's amazing that you could be a prophet of God and feel like you want to take your life. Go read the story. I don't got time to read it for you. It's in First and Second Kings. He wants to take his life because of the oppression of Queen Jezebel. It's not even King Ahab. It's Queen Jezebel is making him want to turn his back on what God has called him to do. That's what you feel like when you're in the cave. That's what you feel like when you're isolated. I'm, I'm bringing these stories up to you because I want you to know you're not alone. I want you to know you're not by yourself when you feel that way. So he feels like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And you know why he was there? He was there because he thought he was the only one who still believed. He thought he was the only one that was still fighting the fight. He didn't realize that God had 
Isaiah's, that God had Junior's, that God had Jericho's, that God had Mickey's. God's saying, what are you saying, Elijah? This is just you. Son, I've got 7,000 who have never been to knee to bail and have been serving me faithfully. So what you need when you get in a crisis or in trial like that, when you're in the cave, you need a word from God. God shows up for Elijah. He didn't leave him alone in the cave. He showed up and here's what he said. You're not alone. You're not the only prophet. You're not the only preacher. You're not the only, hey, you can try to kill me. A hundred more will pop up. Kill those hundred, a thousand more will pop up. God is bringing a move to us, but you'll never hear it if you're listening to the noise and you don't get in the, and you don't get in the cave to listen. You got to listen. You got to listen when you're going through trial. I told you my, my, my uh, personality, when my mom would get upset at me or my dad would correct me, I would just go to my room and sulk and be alone. And all I could focus on was the things I disliked. The things that I thought were bad, why my parents were bad, why my parents weren't good people, why they didn't let us be like uh, everybody else in the world. I didn't understand it. I didn't, I didn't comprehend it. And so I, I missed moments in my younger age that God could have taken back and, and redeemed those moments. But aren't you grateful that God shows up anyways? God shows up anyways. I'm glad that he did. So God said to him, he said, Elijah, you're here because you think you're alone, but I've got 7,000 just like you. Matter of fact, some of them a little better. So in case you're hearing that the church is dying, in case you're hearing that the gospel is dying, in case you're hearing that Christianity's on the out and there's a new religion in town and there's a new way of serving God and X, Y, and Z, I promise you, when the world is done shouting and Queen Jezebel is done with her parade, God has got 7,000 people who are going to rise up to make a difference in the world we live in today. You are not alone. <clears throat> Look at somebody and say, you are not alone. It was another cave. It was another cave. There was a cave, and this cave came with heating. Not the kind of heating and air conditioning you and I would think of. <clears throat> it, was the key, it was the cave that they threw the three young Hebrew boys in. Right? Because they wouldn't worship. Look at some say worship. They wouldn't worship. Sometimes your decision to worship God brings isolation. They, you know, they, they didn't do nothing wrong. They didn't say you can't worship your Jesus or you can't worship your God. Worship God the way you want to. But don't ask me to do that. Don't ask me to do that. And because they would not do it, they threw them in the cave. And I love this. I love this. I, I, tried to, I tried to, as I was pondering this thought here, I tried to determine when did Jesus show up? When did Jesus show up? Because the people who threw them in, you guys know the story, right? The people who threw them in died because of the, because of the heat. But they didn't, not only did they not die, they didn't even smell like smoke. And the only thing that burned on them was the ropes. So I had to believe. I had to believe that Jesus was not only in the fire. I had to believe Jesus was the fire. That he was in the cave before they ever got there. That he was in the cave before they got there. And that the only reason he became manifest was so that Nebuchadnezzar could know that he was with them even though he was not. Even though the king was not with them, the king of kings was with them. And so I want you to know, I want you to know that before you get into the cave, he's there waiting for you. He's there waiting for you. Look at your neighbor and say, he's there waiting for you. <laughs> I'm going to give you one more cave. Can I give you one more cave? The mentor of these three Hebrew boys was Daniel. <clears throat> and Daniel had one fault, and that fault was that he prayed three times a day. Oh, that we would be guilty of such a sin. Look at your neighbor and say, you could probably pray a little bit more. <laughs> and you'd be like, I, I pray breakfast, lunch, and dinner, pastor, I'm in. I'm in. I don't miss a meal. Come on, somebody. I wonder if your prayer life is capturing anybody else's attention. I wonder if our prayer life is capturing the attention of heaven or the attention of hell or the attention of people around us. 
I know that a lot of screens are catching people's attention. I know a lot of songs are catching people's attention. I wonder if our, your prayer life, if our prayer life, this is what I love about this church. You know, I'm, I'm saying this question, but I'm at presenting this question, but it, to us, it's rhetorical because the first seven days of every month, we come and we pray. If you're a part of this church for any length of time, we will teach you how to get a hold of God for yourself through devotions and daily devotions. Come on, somebody, are you hearing me? How to hear God every day. Somebody say every day. So we're teaching you to pray, but if your prayer isn't causing chaos, maybe your prayer is not where it should be yet. Because Daniel gets sent to a cave. He gets sent to a cave. I know what you're saying. Well, Eli, if, if, if Jesus showed up as Joseph's older brother and, and, and he showed up as a small, still voice to Elijah and, 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 who, who, and he showed up as the fire to the Hebrew boys, how, how did Jesus show up? He was already there. The problem is we have trouble seeing him because we have carnal eyes and not spiritual eyes. Eli, what are you talking about? Well, Joseph's fourth brother, his name was Judah. Judah. And the Bible said that Jesus would descend from Judah, the tribe of Judah. And here's what Jesus was called. Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so when he got in there, everybody saw the roaring lions of destruction. But Jesus is the lion of all lions. And when Jesus roars, every lion has to line up. So nobody else could hear it, but Jesus went, Rawr. Yeah, help me out, man. I can't roar very good right now. My throat's not cooperating. He roared. And the lions align themselves because Jesus is the king of all kings. You see him there. But in all these stories, the older brother for Joseph, he left. He left. The voice that, that, he, that Elijah heard, it, it left. The fire eventually died off in the, in the cave for the furnace uh, for the Hebrew boys. And the lions went back to eating the next person that got thrown in after... Daniel got removed. But that did not paint the picture that Jesus wanted for us. Jesus didn't want visitation with you. Jesus wanted habitation. So the final cave recorded in the Bible was the cave they put Jesus in and rolled the stone over. He went in the cave because he said, I don't want a visitation with you. He went in the cave because he wanted to tell the world that he had the keys of hell, death, and the grave. And there would no longer be a cave. There would no longer be a room. There would no longer be a trial. There would no longer be a struggle. There would no longer be a problem. There would no longer be a person that could separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. He went into the cave of death so that he could forever be with you and me. You are not alone. You are not alone. <laughs> you didn't think I wasn't going to be long. I told you it was going to be long. I want you to come back next week. Billionaires are taking their lives. Husbands are leaving their wives. Wives are leaving their husbands. Young people every day are selling, them them, are selling themselves out because they feel lonely. <clears throat> Our culture has adopted the mentality that if I'm going to take a young lady on a date and I'm going to take her to a movie and buy her a dinner, then she owes me her body. Baby, if all you're worth is a steak and a movie... Better tell that joker to take a hike. Amen. But what's the motivation? Johnny, what's the motivation? If I don't put out, I'm going to be alone. Jesus went to the cave so no man could ever make you feel like you're alone. Amen. Yeah, I told you I'm going to give it to you real. Women are leading 70% of divorces that are happening today. Women are leading the divorce rate. 
So now men are going, I work, I bring home the money, I take care of my house. It's still not enough. Still not enough. What do I got to do? Take on another job. What do I got to do? I give up on my home. What do I got to do? Eli, if I don't do what she says to do, I'm going to be alone. My friend, Jesus gave his life on the cross. So that no matter what any woman said to you, no matter what any woman dictated to you, made you feel like, said, spoke over your life, you are not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> you may say today, Eli, I, I didn't have a father. I get that. I get that. My mother was this. I, I get that. I get that. Let me say this to you. How many of you spanked your kids less than you got spanked? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Do you know that my kids didn't give half the spankings that I got? I'm talking about half. And yet to them, life was so difficult. All the. Here, here's, what I, here's what I came to. I'm preaching right now. Leave me alone. Here's what I came to understand. It's not, it's not what you do. It's what we think. It's how I interpret the situation. And it could be one spanking and now I'm just, I'm just abandoned by my parents and they don't love me because they spanked me that one time. You're never going to be a good enough parent. And I say that to you as a young child. Not a young child, a young adult. Because sometimes you judge your parents by your experience. But the truth is, you probably had a better dad than the person next to you. You probably had a better mom than the person next to you. But all you can see is the challenges and the negativity. And so you know what the whole plan of the enemy is? To get you alone. My dad, if my dad, if my dad just would have went to every game. Hey, your dad may have not been there, but you know who was? Your father in heaven watched every move you made. Come on, you got to get this right. You got to get this right because we'll judge each other and we'll push each other away and a man will kill himself going to work, trying to catch every game, trying to take care of his wife, trying to take care of the home. Try, mamas are driving around. Everybody's killing himself just to watch you score a touchdown that nobody will remember. But you set your value on that. No, you got to be bigger than that. You got to be bigger than that. You got to cut your parents some slack. Now, if you were home watching Days of Our Lives and you didn't go watch your son play, we got another message for you. Come next week. <laughs> You're not alone. Just because your parents didn't watch your game didn't mean you were alone. Just because they didn't take you out like somebody else went out. When you grow up, you'll understand their story. It's different. It's different for everybody. Which one of you wouldn't try to be a better parent than what you had as a parent? It's difficult. So all I'm saying is cut your parents some grace and stop letting the enemy tell you you're alone because you're not. You're not. Pastor, I lost my wife. I lost my husband. I mentioned this. I just, this I'm concluding the message. This is our theme for the year. I may touch it again, but I'm ending the theme. Loss happens. We lose. You lose people you love. My daddy, I love him to death. I still don't understand why he's not with us. Most loving, intelligent, God-serving, God-fearing man I've ever met in my life. I got questions. But I will not let the enemy make me feel alone. My dad gave me his best, and my dad is with his father, and I'm on my way to see him soon when my time is up. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. <laughs> So when you grieve, when you grieve, what do you hear? What do you hear? Take time because the older brother is there. Because the small still voice is there. Because the fire is there. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah is there. And he didn't come to visit like he did those men in the Old Testament. He, he came to stay with you and to be by your side. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not alone. 
I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Oh, man. It's the last Sunday of March. Got one more? Got one more Sunday in March. I want to encourage you as you leave today. I want to encourage you as you continue to walk this journey. You're not alone. And God is with you. Just do me a favor. Stand to your feet. Give God a big old praise if you can. Guys, come on. Give me a big old praise.